This is the Adrenal Insufficiency video series. My name is Irina Venkos, and this is part 5, Diagnosing Adrenal Insufficiency. How do we diagnose adrenal insufficiency? First, we have to have those clinical symptoms and signs that raise clinical suspicion of adrenal insufficiency. Secondly, we use either baseline or dynamic tests to diagnose adrenal insufficiency, as well as the subtype of adrenal insufficiency. Finally, we use tests to diagnose the cause of adrenal insufficiency. And these tests differ based on subtype of adrenal insufficiency. Let's start with clinical suspicion. Symptoms of adrenal insufficiency that can be seen in any type of adrenal insufficiency include fatigue, weight loss, and gastrointestinal symptoms, such as nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Signs and symptoms seen only in primary adrenal insufficiency are those related to aldosterone deficiency, such as dizziness, or elevated ACTH, such as hyperpigmentation. Symptoms and signs specific to glucocorticoid-induced adrenal insufficiency include those symptoms of iatrogenic Cushing syndrome. Let's review tests to diagnose adrenal insufficiency. Let's start with baseline tests to diagnose adrenal insufficiency. In both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency, cortisol and DHA sulfate are low. In primary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH is high, while in secondary adrenal insufficiency, ACTH is low or inappropriately normal. As secondary adrenal insufficiency does not present with aldosterone deficiency, both aldosterone and renin, as well as potassium and sodium, are all within normal ranges. This is not the case with primary adrenal insufficiency, in which the majority of patients do develop aldosterone deficiency. As such, we will see low aldosterone and high renin. And in advanced cases, we will also see abnormal potassium, high potassium, and low sodium. These are the ba baseline tests to diagnose adrenal insufficiency. Dynamic tests include cosyntropin stimulation test or synthetic ACTH stimulation test in both primary and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Secondary adrenal insufficiency can also be diagnosed using overnight metiripon test or insulin tolerance test. Let's review several cases of adrenal insufficiency. This is case number one, a 23-year-old woman who presented with complaints of 10 pounds of weight loss, hyperpigmentation, fatigue, and apathy. She reported salt craving and dizziness on change of position. I'm highlighting the symptoms that are seen in adrenal insufficiency, especially in primary adrenal insufficiency, as she also has signs of aldosterone deficiency with salt craving and dizziness, and hyperpigmentation, which is seen only in primary and not secondary adrenal insufficiency. What is the next step? First, our clinical suspicion is pretty high here. She has multiple symptoms of adrenal insufficiency. So the next step is to proceed with baseline tests, which included cortisol and ACTH. Baseline morning cortisol was very low at 2 micrograms per deciliter, and ACTH was extremely high at 2,566 picomoles per liter, when normal ranges go up to 60. We can absolutely diagnose primary adrenal insufficiency just based on this baseline test, and no further testing is necessary. But we still do not know why she has primary adrenal insufficiency. And the next step is to determine the reason behind adrenal insufficiency. Looking at reasons for primary adrenal insufficiency, the most common etiology of primary adrenal insufficiency in the United States is Addison's disease or autoimmune primary adrenal insufficiency. And as such, 
The next best step is to measure adrenal antibodies or 21 hydroxylase antibodies. If positive, workup is complete and we can diagnose autoimmune adrenalitis. However, is negative, other causes of primary adrenal insufficiency should be sought. And this include congenital adrenal hyperplasia, adrenal liquid dystrophy, especially in young men, adrenal infiltration, or drugs that impact cortisol production. In this patient who has primary adrenal insufficiency, the next step included measurement of 21 hydroxylase antibodies. These were very high, consistent with a diagnosis of autoimmune primary adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease. This is case number two, a 37-year-old man who presented with complaints of fatigue and nausea. He reported no orthostasis and no weight loss. She had, he had no history of exogenous glucocorticoid use or pituitary disorders and no history of autoimmune disorders. Fatigue and nausea are common symptoms of adrenal insufficiency, but these symptoms are not specific to adrenal insufficiency and can be seen in many other disorders. As such, additional testing is needed. Next step would include baseline testing for adrenal insufficiency, and those included cortisol, which was low at 5 micrograms per deciliter, and ACTH that was 12 picomol per liter, normal 10 to 60, so this is a low normal result. While this is somewhat abnormal, it is not completely diagnostic of adrenal insufficiency, and as such, additional testing is required. Reviewing dynamic tests that can be used to diagnose secondary adrenal insufficiency this include synthetic ACTH stimulation test, overnight metropon test, and insulin tolerance tests. I would like to remind you about cassintropin stimulation test or synthetic ACTH stimulation test. The test, this test is most commonly used. It is performed in endocrine testing centers most commonly. Cortisol is measured at baseline before cassintropin administration, and then at 30 and 60 minutes after cassintropin stimulation. This test tests for adrenal atrophy. Normal result of this test is peak cortisol above 14 to 18 micrograms per deciliter. Overnight metiropon test is based on the fact that metiropon blocks the conversion of 11-deoxycortisol to cortisol the last step in the production of cortisol in the adrenal gland. As such, after a patient takes metiropon at midnight, cortisol the next morning should be very low. This in turn raises CRH and ACTH, which in turn stimulate adrenal gland production of 11-deoxycortisol. Metiropon is taken orally at midnight with a glass of milk or small snack, and 11-deoxycortisol and cortisol are measured in the next morning. Usually cortisol the next morning is low, under 5 to 7 microns per deciliter. And to, in order to exclude adrenal insufficiency, 11-deoxycortisol would need to be above 7 to 10 microns per deciliter. If it is below this cutoff, then the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency is made. Insulin tolerance test is one of the most rare tests we use in practice because it is expensive, is un it's uncomfortable, and is rarely needed. Insulin is administered per protocol to achieve low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, with glucose under 40 milligrams per deciliter. Cortisol then is measured at baseline before insulin, and then every 15 to 30 minutes per protocol with normal response being cortisol above 18 microns per deciliter. If cortisol is below 18 during this test, then the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency is made. Mm -hmm. To remind you about the case, this patient presented with fatigue and nausea, and he had somewhat abnormal morning cortisol and ACTH baseline tests.
He then proceeded with cassintropin stimulation test, which was abnormal, with peak cortisol of only 12 microns per deciliter. Now that we have made the diagnosis of secondary adrenal insufficiency, the next step is to determine the reason behind secondary adrenal insufficiency. MRI of pituitary gland should be done in every patient with newly diagnosed secondary adrenal insufficiency, unless a clear cause such as exogenous glucocorticoids is identified. If MRI of pituitary gland is positive, for example, a pituitary mass or pituitary inflammation, we should also consider other pituitary deficiencies in addition to secondary adrenal insufficiency. However, is MRI, if MRI is negative, then we have to review drugs that affect CRH and ACTH production, such as glucocorticoids or opioids. We have to review history of previous head trauma that may result into a secondary adrenal insufficiency or review history consistent with Sheehan syndrome. In this patient, pituitary MRI was positive for a pituitary macroadenoma. Thus, we've made the final diagnosis of secondary adrenal insufficiency due to pituitary mass. In summary, symptoms and signs can be suggestive of adrenal insufficiency and also suggestive of subtype of adrenal insufficiency. Both baseline and dynamic tests can be used to diagnose adrenal insufficiency. Baseline tests can be used to diagnose type of adrenal insufficiency, and this includes ACTH. Once a diagnosis is made, testing to determine the reason for adrenal insufficiency is needed in all patients. This concludes the five introductory series on adrenal insufficiency.